I'll read the standard opening statement. Uh, this is the Northampton Conservation Commission <coughs> for the 8th of December, uh, 2022. The commission is a group of unpaid volunteers who work to protect the natural environment of Northampton. We are concerned with the eight interests defined in the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act. Our duties also include open space acquisition and management. We operate in a way that's consistent with open meeting law requirements. All meeting dates, times, and agendas are posted in advance, and we invite public comment during our meetings. However, we ask the public to limit their comments to issues that are within our purview. Uh, today, we have a continuation of a notice of intent for remediation of contaminated soil and bank stabilization along the Mill River at the Cutlery Building. A uh, request for determination of applicability to determine if transformer and utility pole installation within the riverfront area and the buffer zone of the Mill River is subject to the Wetlands Act or the Wetlands Ordinance, uh, that on uh, Nanatuck Street. Uh, and then a notice of intent for construction of a stormwater outfall within the buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands on Locust Street near Smith Folk. Um, also at the end of the meeting, a request for a certificate of compliance um, at Village Hill. Uh, we didn't have any minutes um, this time around to approve. Uh, so first ask if there's any public comment that is uh, not addressing a specific case that we're gonna be talking about today. If not, we'll go to that first case, a continuation of a notice of intent for remediation of contaminated soils and bank stabilization at the Mill River uh, at the Cutlery Building. Uh, we've received some updated information. Um, anything uh, the applicant wants to uh, add uh, or present by way of summary? Uh Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Barry Fogel from Keegan Worland. I'm here with Alan Verson, the applicant, Lyons Witten, the licensed site professional, and Josh Charette, the wetland scientist. Um, no, we don't have anything to add um, on top of what we submitted last week for uh, responses to the requests that the commission had presented at the last hearing. So we're prepared to answer any questions and respond as you'd like. Very good, thank you. Um, and I have a few, but I'll ask first if other commissioners have questions uh, or comments they want to make. Well, I'll start then. Um, are there other metals uh, uh, that are um, at risk um, other than lead? Your um, application and follow-up talks a lot about uh, lead and the eventual a consolidation into a lead silicate um, uh, by blast ducts. Uh, um, are there other metals uh, that are uh, at issue here in this location? Uh, Lions of Witten here, LSP. There are a number of metals present at the site uh, above allowable levels. The lead, uh, Lead is the one that is the focus of treatment because that, when, when the lead is treated, um, the other metals are similarly sequestered. Uh, and the technology out there in the world talks about lead. So that's, that's why the verbal focus on lead, but there, there are other metals out there, absolutely. And I, I ask because your uh, follow-up letter of uh, November 30th um, uh, talks about the uh, uh, last docs um, modifying pH and then in a three-step process, eventually creating a lead silicate, but doesn't address any other metals. And I'm uh, you just asserted uh, uh, verbally that other metals are also sequestered. Um, where uh, I guess I'd want to see uh, more okay. information about that. So the the concern at any site with metals is will they leach to groundwater? Mm -hmm. And lead is the metal uh, most likely to leach to groundwater. We've done leachability 
testing on multiple soil samples. And it has been determined that uh, there aren't leachable quantities of lead, that the lead at this site doesn't leach to groundwater or shouldn't based on the testing. And our actual testing of groundwater also shows that the uh, leaching of lead to groundwater is at levels that are acceptable to DEP. And the treatment of the soil that we're going to move by blast docks further ensures that that won't happen. So all the soil that's to be moved will be treated with blast docks and added to the stockpile. So the site should be better than it is now. And now uh, the levels of metals that might leach to groundwater are within acceptable limits. Can, uh, can you describe the process by which the blast docks um, comes into contact with those metals so that it can um, create ultimately a, a durable sure. silicate? Um, because I'm, I'm imagining that, I mean, my concern is that you can do an awful lot of work on a macro scale, but uh, that could allow uh, handfuls, shovelfuls, small amounts of contaminated soil to not be in contact with the blast dock. So I'm wondering how you make sure that it's a comprehensive treatment. Okay. I'll start by saying that Currently, there isn't a groundwater issue with respect to the metals, and the blast docks is insurance that that doesn't happen in the future. The process, you asked, is the, the blast docks arrives in large tote sacks, um, roughly four feet by four feet by four feet. Um, and the material is scooped out of the sack is brought to adjacent to the area being excavated. Uh, the blast ox is scooped out of the tote sack uh, by the excavator, lowered to the soil about to be excavated, spread on the soil, then mixed into the soil in place um, until it has an appearance of uniformity. And then that soil is then excavated and placed in a truck to be moved from that location to the stockpile. And that visual uniformity is uh, uh, adequate to ensure that there's uh comprehensive contact between the treating material, the last docks, yep. and the, the needed, the soil that needs treatment. It's, it's mixed in place, then it's excavated and put in a truck so that it's mixing more, and then it's dumped at the stockpile location, and the dumping process mixes it more, and then it's spread around, so it's the thickness that it needs to be in that location. So it's comprehensive enough, and that is the standard process for application of that and other similar uh, treatments for metals. Uh, it's also the process that we used in 2006 for uh, soils that came from the other properties up to the stockpile. Exact same process. Thank you. Sure. Um, and other commissioners, feel free to jump in. I'm going down my list here, but I imagine other people have a list as well. Um, uh, there's there's an orange uh, layer at some point that will serve as a, an indicator that oh, uh, we're getting down. Um, uh, what happens if the orange layer becomes visible? What, what, what happens then? Uh, you mean in future years? Yes. Uh, if the orange layer becomes visible, then it's supposed to be 
recovered um, to the specifications uh, in in our plans. Uh, it's one of the reasons that we do an annual LSB inspection of the site. There are other areas of the site that have similar marker layers. Um, and when those occasionally become exposed in one or two areas, we go back and as part of the maintenance, we go back and cover them, and reseed those areas. So the same would happen on this portion of the site. And that would be part of a uh, um, operating and maintenance plan for? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, that, that, this is a voluminous application, so they may, it may have been in there somewhere, but I didn't. I don't remember seeing it. Um, uh, Can I so, jump in? Certainly, Paul. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of maintenance of the, um, the wall and the gabion baskets, and the riprap that's being put down, is there a plan for handling that? I mean, is, they sound rather uh, durable, but what might uh, be anticipated as a problem that requires maintenance? I, su I suppose uh, you could have a large tree float down the river and a spring storm and knock out a chunk of the wall. Uh, well, the lions, the you won't, you won't, you won't have trees falling over onto it and, and knocking it down. So lions, the intent is for this to be stable to the point where it doesn't. It, it certainly is. The intent is for it to be uh, stable. as stable as the original wall, more stable than the original wall. And the original wall was built in the 1860s. So it's 160 years old at this point and in need of some attention, which is what this application is all about. Yep. Thank you. Danger of high water undercutting the wall, lower end? I don't believe so. That's why the, the, the riprap is, is being placed above the wall itself. So that that doesn't happen. Okay. It's going up to the hundred-year flood elevation, and above that, it's still protected with uh, geocell. I had an, a question about the chain link fences. I know they're going to stay in place. In terms of wildlife passage, um, and it's, I. I understand it's not realistic to raise all of the fences from the ground up a bit, but there's the idea of putting holds in them. Could you say more about that? Um, sure. Under current conditions, uh, that is not recommended, um, but as soon as we have a secure site that has a permanent solution, the addition of some holes in the fence to facilitate wildlife passage would be fine. But under current conditions, um, Mass DEP would consider any hole in the fence, even if it was a foot by a foot at ground level, um, a way that quote unquote trespassers or fishermen or other eager individuals wanting to get to the river could access the site. That's that's how they view it. And it would it's it is not currently permissible. It would be when the project is complete and we have a permanent solution, then we can cut wildlife uh, passage access holes. Could you also at that point elevate the fence to allow uh, 18 inches or two feet uh, access throughout rather than just in specific holes? I think that would be up to the owner. Uh, 18 inches to two feet sounds like an invitation for anybody to access the site. Um, but I, we can talk about how big those holes would be and how regular along the fence. I, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, if the commission were to put a condition in an order that said 
it, once the permanent solution is implemented, the applicant shall come to the commission and discuss, you know, a, what can be done to open up some holes, and then he can have figured out sort of what the best whether it's the whole fence, that sounds hard to support, but you know, enough holes to make it possible for small mammals to make their way through without running into a barrier. I, perhaps I could speak to that. Um, I, that would be fine to have a hole the size to let animals through, <clears throat> but we could not have holes so big or access so easy that anyone who wanted to get in, get to the river could do so. Yeah. That, that we could not allow. Understood. Um... So I, uh, one of the other things, again, it may be in somewhere in the application, but I didn't see it. Uh, our uh, our commission's discretion at, uh, uh, allowing or issuing an order of conditions for this kind of project um, is uh, has to consider the uh, improvements of that uh, over present conditions um, that are there. And I, uh, I've seen your... Um, uh, description of a uh, of wetlands replication um, area <clears throat> on the same parcel, a little distance away from the wetland that's going to be uh, damaged. Uh, but I didn't see an invasive plan, um, and that's often something that, for uh, uh, consideration of things like this, that we want to see uh, what what is there uh, by way of a plan to address. Uh, invasive plants. And, and I might just add that that would likely be particularly important here because some of the invasives that are already present on the site could potentially damage that marker layer and, and infiltrate the, the soils below. Um, there, there's a pretty high incidence of knotweed, which can be damaging. Hmm. I, I can say that we would not object to a requirement that the knotweed be treated uh, if, if you, if you um, included that in the order, it would save us the problem of coming back for another permit. But we do plan to, uh, to treat the knotweed with uh, proper herbicides. Okay. Um, the uh, uh, I have I have a, a, a couple of other questions. Um, uh, just one thing, Kevin, on on the sure, uh, on the knotweed that was actually discussed at the site visit. Um, either just before we started it with their um, their plant expert there sometime during the. I visit, but I um, recall that being discussed. Um, your besides and the best way of applying it and when to apply it. Thanks, Mason. Um, in terms of uh, taking down uh, trees, uh, you um, identified 96 trees uh, that uh, some of which are quite substantial uh, to come down. Um, I'm wondering and I'm, I'm familiar with logging operations um, and how um, disruptive that is. And I'm wondering if, how do you um, ensure that the uh, taking down and pulling out root balls of all these trees before the blast stocks has been applied uh, doesn't just uh, disturb and, and, and diffuse uh, some of what you're trying to encapsulate and protect. Uh, uh, is it possible or desirable to work on, you know, 25 or 50 foot uh, sections at a time? So you're doing more limited disruption rather than uh, the kind of clear cutting that I'm imagining 96 trees would represent. Um, understood. Uh, the plan 
is to install the log mats so that the crane required to remove the trees and the trucks required to take them off site um, aren't disturbing the, I'll call it the upland portions of the site as opposed to the bank. Um, the trees themselves will be removed with a crane. Um, they're not going to fall over, so there'll be portions of them will be attached, they'll be cut, they'll be brought over and laid on a truck. And then the next portion will be cut and laid on a truck. Um, the tree removal folks are not removing the root balls. They're bringing it down to a stump. Uh -huh. The contract, the excavation contractor who will be applying blast docks will be going in limited sections, working on a limited section at a time removing the root balls, applying the blast docks, doing the excavation, uh, okay. applying new materials, and then moving to the next section. So it will, the disturbance will be limited um, for precisely the reasons you mentioned. Okay, again, uh, is that in your uh, application, the, that description of how the work is gonna proceed? I believe it's in our response to OTO's comments. What, what I'm uh, what, what I'm trying to do here is uh, we as a commission uh, usually are looking at uh, not just the immediate situation but uh, what goes with the deed what what uh, a generation from now would uh, a future owner um, be constrained by and we're also looking at um, how reliable and how durable um, uh, the fix that um, is being proposed is going to be, uh, and that's why we usually require an operation maintenance plan. And sometimes that operation maintenance plan is just for periodic monitoring um, and then uh, uh, repair back to some, um, uh, the, the condition as you were describing, it, if the orange layer became visible, it'd have to Put it back to the specs uh, in your application. Um, so we we usually uh, and and we usually also by the way, uh, in terms of an alternatives analysis, um, have uh, required and an, a more exhaustive alternative analysis than you provided, where the number of square foot dis disturbed, all the pluses and minuses, uh, the financials, and all of that stuff. Um, and my sense is, and just I don't know what the rest of the commissioners are feeling, that you've indicated, um, I think adequately, although not comprehensively, what some of those alternatives might be and why you ended up going up with this this plan. So I'm I'm comfortable at this point saying, okay, uh, didn't do the kind of alternatives analysis we often want to see, uh, but it you did enough so that I have a sense that yep, you you did think about stuff and you followed it along until you could see that no, that's a dead end, and then um, you ended up with uh, the plan that we see before us. Um, so I'm, I'm inclined to think that this is a, uh, a an order that um, I at least can support issuing. But I then see all the kinds of questions that we've just been talking about for the last 20, 30 minutes, uh, an awful lot of conditions that we can put in the order or um, uh, additions or things made more explicit in your application or in your plans. Um, uh, if we put it in, in all in conditions, um, then we have to have a, either a much longer meeting today, or we have to say, all right, we'll have uh, Sarah approve, uh, or you can come back to the commission uh, with specific conditions, uh, how you're going to execute specific conditions, how you're going to do an operating and management plan, how we, uh, uh, et, et cetera. Um, the, the, uh, so I'm, uh, right now, I'm trying to get a sense of all right, do we uh, move forward? And again, I say, we, we we haven't discussed this as a commission because we can't outside of a public hearing. So I don't know how anybody else feels, but uh, my inclination is to say, oh, this is probably permittable. Um, 
but there's got to be a bunch of different conditions that are going to requ be required. And the, the question I'm having is, so do we try to specify what all those conditions are now and uh, as a headline for each one, and then you uh, come back uh, and we say staff approval will be necessary before construction can begin uh, on each of those conditions. And then that puts the burden on Sarah. Um, or do we say, here's the headlines, and we'll, why don't you go back and uh, come back with a plan of execution for how you're going to address those conditions, and then it won't be up to Sarah, you could just come back to a future meeting of the commission. So that's, that's where my questions are coming from right now. Uh, Attorney Vogel. Yeah, I would, I would say that I, I checked while Lyons was speaking, and in fact, all that sequencing that you talked about and he talked about in terms of the tree cutting and the and the stumps is in the detailed in the response to the OTO comments. And so listening to what you just said, my recommendation would be that you, you know, as you always do in an order of conditions, you you cite the plans, the sheets, obviously, and then whatever narrative materials were submitted and you can impose a condition or conditions that say the the methodologies shall follow the protocols stated in the notice of intent the revised notice of intent the details on the plans the information in the remedy the remedy implementation plan the phase four that was attached to the notice of intent that details a lot of that as well and the response to the comments from the commission and from OTO. And so that kind of packages in all those things are those details, construction sequencing, construction methodology, O and M, and you don't have to rewrite them <laughs> um, and neither do we. So that, that would be my suggestion if we could, is that you condition it on, you must do this the way that you said you would in all of the materials you presented to us. Um, and then obviously you have your conditions of pre-construction meetings. Um, yep. You're yep. welcome as well as Sarah is obviously at any site for inspections and the like. You, you can have a condition for, you know, maybe status reports weekly or, you know, get some information about when the project's moving from step one to step two and you can come see or and get an update. But, you know, that kind of stuff is certainly reasonable in this circumstance. Um, let, let, let me uh, get to the rest of my list of questions before we move, uh, but I, I wanted to put, provide that framework for uh, where I'm coming from and asking these questions. Uh, you've described the access roadway by which a lot of work is going to be done as temporary, um, but I don't, I don't see... Uh, uh, again, somewhere in the plan, it may be there, but I don't see. So what's the restoration? How does that, uh, once its use is fulfilled, uh, and you say it's temporary, is is there some kind of, is it going to be seeded or planted, or um, what, what are the plans for the roadway? And what kind of, again, what kind of operation and maintenance plan would be required um, if any, uh, if it's not just going to be returned uh, to uh, natural conditions. So the, the construction access is that little, there's like a tab of area that goes off of Riverside Drive to the area where the um, stockpile will be created. And if it were to be temporary, if it were to remain temporary, it would be the, at the end before the doors locked, the material would be removed, it would be regraded and seeded um, with the na native seed mix. But um, Alan, I don't know if you wanna, so we, we, may, we may have had a discussion here before about that piece possibly being made permanent because it would provide access- Access for maintenance, right. And, and Alan and Lyons, but I think Alan spoke with the, um, the uh, is it Doug McDonald? Is that the DPW? Um, yes. Right. And and he was he thought that that you know was something that was would be discussed and along with the curb cut that goes with removing the guardrail in that area. So so Alan, I know you had some thoughts about you know whether you want actually want to stick with it being temporary or if you wanted to ask for how the commission would consider possibly having that become permanent. It, it's all of what lines a uh, couple hundred square feet. 
It is 370 square feet. 370 square feet, but it's not a large area, but, and it's outside of the inner 100 of the riverfront. But Alan, I'll, I'll hand it off to you if that was something you wanted to. Yes. To discuss. <clears throat> I, I think that it makes much more sense to have it be permanent, even though our original application referred to it as temporary. Um, the problem is if it's, if it is removed, the, we would have to helicopter into the site. There's no, there is access at present over Valley Home Improvements property, mm -hmm. but that can't be used repeatedly in the future. Um, so that is no access at all. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense to eliminate the only access that we would have from a public street. So I think it makes sense um, to, and, and what we would do is since take the gate that actually is on Valley Home Improvements property and move it to Riverside Drive where the plan shows a temporary access and that would become a permanent access uh, and the only way to get to the property. So I, I would, I if we can make that a, amendment or change. I'm not sure technically how it would be handled, but that is what would make sense for all concerned. So that's and, a little and, bit different than the plans that were submitted and reviewed both by the Conservation Commission to date and the DPW as part of the stormwater permits. So if you were proposing to keep it permanent, you'd have to update your stormwater calculations and go back to DPW for an amended stormwater. Um, I, I can actually, um, Barry referred to that I, I did have a conversation myself with Doug McDonald and described this to him. He said that he thought that it was a good idea. He had no objections to it. I said, I want to be clear. Am I, can I make a representation to the commission that that is your opinion? And he said, yes, I can. And, and just to be clear, on one of the plans, Sarah, I think that you might be referring to, there was one of the sheets that showed access as being this sort of R-shaped length. But in fact, that's on the stockpile, most of it. So the 370 feet that Lyons was referring to was just the area from Riverside Drive up to the... Property line. What? Up to the property. Oh, the, what's that? What direction is that? Riverside Drive is... West. It, it west. would be west. So to, to that the property at, line. At that point. So in fact, that's when um, Alan spoke with Doug. It was making clear that it was just that small 370 feet that's really considered the access that's not already the, the rest of the once you get over that, you're on the stockpile. And once the stockpile is completed, that continues to be the method of access. It can be driven upon. Um, go ahead, Lance. And, uh, just um, but, a quick question uh, before it, you get to that. Did DPW have concerns with that, you know, not necessarily from a stormwater perspective, but keeping that open as a permanent curb cut? He, he did not. I specifically discussed that with him. He said that, I mean, obviously, we'd have to apply for a curb cut, but he saw no problems with that occurring. We talked about the sight lines from that point and the fact that that would be the only access to the property. And as I say, again, he I was very, very clear with him that I would represent this to the commission as the DPW's position. And he said, that's all right. I wanted to address the chairman's initial part of the question with how would it be finished at the end? Um, as a construction entrance, it will be uh, large rock in order to uh, trap sediment from truck tires um, to allow that to fall off and be retained <laughs> on the site, not go out on the road. Um, when we're done, the upper layers of that can be removed and it can be changed over to a, you know, half stone, half loam type mix on the top and seeded. So it'll all, it'll blend in with the rest of the site. 
I have the same seed mix as the top of the stockpile and the 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 and, road and along what, the top of the levy. What what kind of ongoing maintenance would be required in order to uh, salvage its its function as an access point for future repairs or monitoring? <laughs> I don't understand your question. It would not, it wouldn't have to be other than stopping sort of large woody growth that would prevent a vehicle from passing, but it would be, it would be kept as a low growing grasses and vegetation. Is that what so, you mean? So brush hogging uh, annually or something like that? How do you, you know, to keep the, large woody stems from uh, intruding and preventing its access. If you're going to keep it as a permanent uh, function, which has some logic if there's need for future monitoring and repair or monitoring and, and uh, maintenance, um, it makes sense that, no, you don't want six, six eight inch diameter trunks in the way. So uh, right. you have to, before they start, you got to get rid of them. And I'm, So I, I don't know if it would be annual for that. Lyons, what, how frequently do you expect, what kind of vehicle would need to get down there with what frequency do you think? Uh, the right. idea is to be able to access the site um, with a pickup truck. Um, the frequency is, all I can say is not very often. Uh, right. Most of the time, and although, you know, well, most I, of the time, I, we don't yeah, need to get down there with the truck I, at I all. Just, but. Yeah, I think it wouldn't be an annual, like, brush hogging the whole width of the thing. I think it would just be over time. If, if there were a passageway for a pickup truck and there happened to be some something that's grown larger, you take the clippers to it. You know, you wouldn't go in and just, you know, whack everything annually. It's not a, it's not like an Eversource or a national grid, you know, uh, transmission <coughs> line access road. It's not that kind of thing. I, yeah, the only thing that grows on the stockpile at present is knotweed. Right, well, knotweed would block a pickup truck in a season easily. Yeah. Well, that's why, as I said, it will have to be treated. But it will probably need to be treated over time as well. I think that's sort of what Kevin is getting at is like um, the knotweed will return, like it will come downstream. So just understanding sort of how to keep that area clear. We're in New England and things will grow quickly if you are not driving on it very frequently, which is fine and great but yeah it's just helpful to understand kind of what the ongoing maintenance is to keep it open mason well you you're gonna go every year to check the thing anyway aren't you uh, the soil yes. samples and stuff well and you take a look at the entrance well we have a head nod and a head shake about yeah, no soil samples annual i mean you, there's no sampling and well no, the, no, the, the monitor. no there's there's no monitor oh, he mentioned there's, an inspection period every <clears> year Yes, that's a visual inspection, sir. Right. Well, on your yearly visual inspection, you take a look at the the entryway, and uh, by golly, if it needs to be brush hog, you know, bring one with you in the back of the pickups. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the point I was trying to make was that it would be the minimum necessary, as opposed to some kind of regular whacking going on regardless of whether it was needed. And that, that, that was the point. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would suggest that it would be handled on a, on a periodic basis along with the invasive control, which will, will need ongoing help. And, and there was no O&M plan for invasives or for this type of maintenance included in the application or follow-up materials, correct? I'll check with Josh. Josh, do you know if one was put in there? Uh, Josh Charette? I don't believe there was. He just checked out. But we can, you know, I think that's something that can be sort of developed as a standard. Josh, you, you can come up with a standard invasives inspection and maintenance narrative. Absolutely. Yeah. Jen? I just had a really quick question relating to the 
like felling of the trees just and forgive me if this was in there and I missed it. I just tried to search again. Um, what is going to happen to the slash with all of those trees? Is it going to stay on site or be chipped and brought off site? Yes. It will be chipped and brought off site. Okay. And is the, is the reasoning behind that just to kind of I mean, obviously with the contaminated site and the soil that you're moving, you need access to the soil layer, but for the rest of it, is there a reasoning for not leaving some of that on site? Uh, the reasoning mostly had to do with the fact that there would be a large amount of it. And were we to deposit all that material on the site, <laughs> we'd be burying all the current vegetation, yep. which Sarah had objected to during the site visit. And that's reasonable. So offsite, it will go. Thank Most you. Okay, so uh, commissioners, it seems like we uh, at least have hit all the items on my list and uh, don't know if you have uh, others. Uh, it seems like there's a few things to be added, um, and uh, we could either put them in headline form and um, say, okay, that condition is uh, there, and as uh, Attorney Fogel suggested, we can make reference to specific plans where those uh, headlines are addressed, and then in a couple of areas, um, like the uh, uh, monitoring of the uh, the access road or the in dealing with invasives where they're not yet addressed, um, that uh, those would be articulated and we could um, ask Sarah to approve them. Or we could say to uh, the applicant, um, all right, well, we've identified the headline issues. Some of them are already addressed in your application and a couple are not. Uh, come back to us with a more complete um, application that addresses those things um, in a future meeting. Um, I guess, uh, Sarah, before I volunteer you to be the uh, um, the, the the arbiter of uh, all of this, uh, what, what's your comfort level? Um, I, I'm, I don't want to not do our responsibility as a commission uh, by pushing it over to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I would need to know and have it reflected in the permitting documents that the commission finds clearly that all of the responses to the concerns raised and the uh, construction sequencing and documentation provided so far is appropriate uh, and should be followed. You know, if there are suggested changes to that, those would need to be made now rather than trying to address it later. And for me, the only changes that I, uh, I know there's been comments that we expect the, uh, the, the riprap and uh, uh, retaining wall and gabion wall to be uh, essentially century long plus and therefore permanent. I'd still want to have uh, for many of these things an, an annual look that says, hey, um, yep, it hasn't started to fall apart yet. Um, and, uh, but I, I uh, uh, since it's going to be a need for annual look at uh, invasives, <clears throat> and it's going to be an annual look at um, whether uh, woody stems are getting to be too large, et cetera, et cetera, um, that uh, I, I'd want to see a number of things addressed on like that. Um, uh, but that is the only thing that I think, Sarah, I, I'm aware of that I think is above and beyond what we've already seen in the application. Lance? How long is the inspection period for the soils or the, the project itself? Um, I guess Whitten, yeah. that's when the answer there. Uh, the inspection period is essentially infinite oh. because the project in order to get a permanent solution, the property will get an activity and use limitation placed on the deed. Mm -hmm. And it will be very similar to the activity and use limitations that currently exist on the developed cutlery property and the Valley Home Improvement property, whereby any fencing, 
uh, orange marker layers uh, installed as part of the permanent solution. Um, and in time posting that's required um, are checked on an annual basis to ensure that the orange marker layer is not exposed. And if it is, that it, it's part of the operation and maintenance, it gets covered again and brought back to spec. So we've been doing that on the lower portions of the site uh, on an annual basis since 2000, whatever it was, five, three, uh, I don't remember. Um, and that will continue into the future. From the from a conservation commission standpoint, um, to your point, Mr. Chairman, is that you you may do this in Northampton. I've seen it in many communities that when a certificate of compliance is issued, you make some conditions in perpetuity. I, you know, in the so it's in the chain of you know, mm -hmm. title recorded with the certificate of compliance that the commission shall be informed of annual or of the inspections and the mm -hmm. condition of the barrier and the stability of you know, things that you were just talking about. Um, you can have that made as a condition that runs in perpetuity <clears throat> through the certificate of compliance. And my uh, uh, non-legalistic understanding is that a certificate of compliance addresses the extent to which the work has complied with the conditions um, in the order of conditions. So I would well, think but if we one want of the to, conditions want to state the order those conditions in the order of conditions. Right. Yeah, for right. sure. And so I, you know, but but anything that's written in the order that says, you know, if there's erosion in the riverfront area, you know, that has to be restabilized or something. You make that a condition or or you shall perform in accordance with your statement that this is going to not erode and da da da. So it can be made part of the repeated conditions that, you know, for example, I don't know if you do it here. Many certificates of compliance say condition, special condition six, eight, 10, 12, 14, and 21 are in perpetuity, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, I, I was going to say that too. There are ongoing conditions that you put right. on either the notice of intent or on the compliance. I'm happy to work with Sarah. I mean, I don't know what your protocol would be, but you know, many times a commission will draft a, an order with special conditions in it. And then if if you're amenable to it, if, if Sarah drafts some stuff and wants to, you know, say, I fill in the blank here for me, show me where that issue is addressed, you know, give me the reference for where that is in the um, either the phase four report or the 21 report or the NOI or on the plans or in the OTO response. So if Sarah wants to just leave a link to as addressed in this submittal, but wants to make the checklist of the issues you raised and the things you want to know were addressed, we can do it that way. I mean, if you're comfortable doing it that way. And we typically don't do this in Northampton, but it, it may be worth doing in this situation that the, um, the commission gives a list of general conditions and then I can provide a draft before the next, you know, if the, if the commission wants to close the hearing either at this meeting or an upcoming meeting, um, they can then take an additional meeting to finalize the order and make sure it says what they thought it would say since this is a more complicated project. Lions. The annual LSP inspection is uh, submitted to Mass DEP. It can be <laughs> expanded from those list of things to cover the items the commission wants to see on an annual basis and that one document can then be submitted, can then be copied to the commission uh, annually as it's sent to Mass DEP. Very, we, we did that for four years of monitoring after the 2005-2006 order uh, notice of intent. And that would be, I think, a, a, a partial satisfaction, uh, but we're, we, we will also have other, um, other, other things that DEP may not require. So, uh, that would be an additional thing, which reminds me, I missed one thing on my list that uh, the replication area, uh, you, uh, your application uh, talked about monitoring for two years. We usually do uh, three to five years and require 75% uh, of the foliage be uh, uh, 
retained during that time or replanted if necessary. Um, so that would be an additional change from uh, or an additional condition um, of, uh, that varies from what you had originally proposed. Whatever the standard is, um, that's appropriate. Can I ask, uh, how do we address changing the entrance from temporary to permanent? Does anything need to be altered in the order that's issued? Well, it, my thought would be, Mr. Chairman, that um, if there are any details that come out of what we've talked about, for example, changing on a there may be a call out on a sheet of the plans that says temporary. And if, so we would give the commission the final plan set with any revised sheets that reflect changes that have been made. For example, like the um, replication area is hand sketched on a sheet we gave mm -hmm. you in recent filing. Right. So, so you would, you would wait, once we know what you want and what you are willing to consider, I'll put it that way, we would submit the updated final sheets and then those dates with the revision dates would be referenced in the order. So Alan, that's how that typically gets covered is once the discussion's gone through any right. any changes like that get made and they have a final plan set. So, so that the order would say the plans submitted as of December X, 2022. And maybe this is a question for Joshua. Were those impacts from the roadway that are now proposed to be permanent included as permanent impacts in the, the NOI? You mean the square footage for the access? Yes. So was that included as a permanent riverfront? No, I think in the NOI it was 370. That was considered temporary. Okay. So I guess the... Uh, uh, Question now, since we seem to be, if I'm gathering from as much as I can read body language and these little squares on Zoom, that uh, we seem to be <laughs> converging toward a uh, yeah, this is this is probably something permittable, um, and there's a, a number of things that either need to be uh, pulled out from the existing application and referred to um, as required in the initial application or added to. Um, and so, and as uh, Tony Fogel was just saying, um, uh, a final plan set, meaning a, a, a final set that would include the uh, operation and maintenance plan and the annual uh, uh, monitoring and what it's going to include and all of that. Um, normally, uh, well, this isn't a very normal case, but it, we can... Uh, either decide to continue for one more meeting and wait till that process is essentially <clears throat> complete. So we're looking at and voting on a final set of, of actual plans, or uh, we can um, uh, move forward with uh, voting on the application as it stands with the condition that that additional set of steps has to happen uh, to the commission satisfaction and to her satisfaction before any uh, 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 construction moves forward. Uh, what would be your suggestion, Sarah? Should we continue for one more meeting and get it all before us? Or uh... I, I think in this case, that might make the most sense. Um, we're not able to issue an order unless we know the, the full proposed <clears throat> um, permanent disturbance in riverfront area, which it seems like we don't at this point. Um, and Alan, if, you, if you'd like to keep the access roadway as permanent, you know, I don't know if there were any other minor changes that you were thinking of making to it, um, given that it, it's not going to be removed at the end of the project. Well, one other thing too, Ms. Sherman. So if, if there's a draft, is, is your process that you then would have a draft order that the commission deliberates on at a meeting? We, we don't usually need to do that. It comes yeah. up really rarely. And we do have a standard set of conditions that all applicants mm -hmm. need to adhere to, pre-construction meeting and submission of any revised plans, et cetera. But um, it, it sounds like in this case, it, it may be helpful to take an additional meeting to review. And the, the, reason I, the reason I asked that is that 
in circumstances that I've been involved with, with commissions where it is complex like this and there's discussion and deliberation on the special conditions, for example, if the public hearing is still open, I've commissions will allow me and the applicant and the experts to discuss it with the commission. Whereas some commissions, if they close the public hearing and then have a discussion on the order at the next one, they say, well, we really can't hear from you because it's not still a public hearing. So depending on how you want to approach it, we'd rather keep the hearing open so we can discuss that with you. Uh, probably probably uh, a, a good point. Um, and uh, I will, so uh, in, in, a, in a minute, I'll ask for a motion to continue. Sarah, when's our next meeting? Are we gonna meet on the 22nd or are we gonna go after into the new year? Uh, so I guess it's up to the commission, I guess. We are at, um, at a, this is a bear for people to continue this. Um, I, I'm available the 22nd, that would be fine with me. I don't know if everybody else is. The, the four people that we would need uh, from this meeting are Jen, Paul, Mason, and and yourself, Kevin. So, what's what's it look like? I'm 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 traveling that day, but I can arrange to be uh, in Vermont, where I'm headed, uh, in time to um, get on Zoom there uh, if we do decide to meet. Um, but it, <coughs> it, I have to confess that will be in the midst of family gathering and you know a lot else going on. So. Uh, uh, if uh, if there's any inclination to uh, push out to uh, the first meeting in January, that might be less cluttered in terms of other activities going on. And you know, Alan, chime in. I mean, I'm I'm going to say this, and I'm chuckling, but I remember when we first contacted Sarah about this back in the spring and said, "Boy, we'd like to get you know open the public hearing because you know we want to get people going." And Sarah goes. Well, the commission likes to do things in one hearing, but I think we all sort of <laughs> knew that this was going to take more than one hearing. Um, but if if you're we're going to go the route where, it's, and and I'm this is a question, Sarah. I'm not saying when you do, but if, <laughs> if it's going to be that Sarah drafts something and is able to share it with me, I don't know that Sarah, if you're going to think you can get to that and be able to get back and forth and then have it be ready for the 22nd. So if that's the route we're going and you want to take the time to get that work through and for me to be able to, us to be able to respond to Sarah with that's in that document and that's in that document, we may, Sarah may need more time for that. <laughs> I, mean, I guess it, it depends on how we wrap it up this evening. You know, if we're in a place where we're just waiting for some extra details on a plan set and an O&M, that wouldn't be such a big deal. If there are a lot of remaining questions and I do have some flag where there's some additional information necessary, that might be a little bit more difficult. Well, let's let's put it on for the 22nd and to see where we're at. If we're not there, then we can always continue to the next one. But let's- yeah. well, In terms of the- in terms of the meeting, hopefully everything would be pretty much agreed in advance right. and would not have to take a lengthy discussion with the commission. So I guess we'd like one, to one would hope that, that you know, it seems always also true that each time we've had a meeting is, oh, we peel back a layer of this onion. And, and, and so uh, I would hope, Alan, that you're right, but we'll we'll have to wait and see. Time, time to be optimistic. Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, um, I'm, I, so Jen, uh, Mason, uh, Paul, what is, um, is I'm available the 22nd. I'm also available the 22nd. And my question for Sarah is what is our first meeting date in January? First meeting in January would be the 12th. Okay, great. I have a conflict the week before, so I just wanted to make sure because I know we're down to narrow quorum. So <laughs> great. So I can either of those is open for me and both. Okay. So tentative schedule for the 22nd at 530. I'll ask for a motion to continue then um, with the possibility that uh, we may decide if it turns out to be a, a more substantial process in between now and then that we may put it off until the first meeting in January. Um, I can, Sarah, send you all the topics that I've talked about today because I kept notes. Uh, and so those are the headlines that I wanted to see more explicitly addressed. 
um, and uh, some of them uh, are apparently already existing in the plans, although I didn't see them uh, or didn't remember them. Um, and some would have to be added. But and I, uh, I know you also had, Sarah, some uh, some things on your staff report that uh, you wanted to see addressed. So I think that would be the list of headlines um, that we're looking for some kind of execution plan to address. So. Can I get a motion to continue? Any further comments by anybody before we? Every every bone in my body is telling me not to ask this, but I think you know. I think you should ask for pub if there's anybody from the public who wants to speak, just so no one who is who does <laughs> that feels shut out at the public hearing. <laughs> ah, before we continue, that's that's. Uh, Properly done. Uh, Allen, it's, it's, it's always nice it's always easier for me to look around the room uh, when I'm right. on the, yeah. the Zoom screen. I can't tell who's it. But if there any member of the public who would like to make a comment or ask a question of the commission about this case before we continue it. Yes, uh, Rick Hudson here. Uh, I think you're doing a good job. Thank you for your service. That's all I have to say. <laughs> thank you. We don't get a lot of compliments, but uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, it's a hard job, but I appreciate how hard it is. And I hope I haven't made it harder. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so can I get a uh, motion Thank to you. continue this case till the uh, 22nd of December? So moved. Moved. I'll second. I second it. Okay. <laughs> One of the uh, and that would be a 5.30. 5.30, first up. Yep. Okay. Uh, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? A roll call, Sarah. Jen? Yes. Paul? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. All right. All right. Thank, thank you all. You the commission. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the next case, uh, which is a request for determination of applicability to determine if transformer and utility pole installation within the riverfront area uh, and the buffer zone to the bank of the Mill River is subject to the Wetlands Ordinance or the Wetlands Act. Uh, this is on Nonatuck Street, uh, Mass Electric being the applicant. Um, so who's here to uh, represent the applicant? Oh, that would be me, Emmett Lawless Taylor, with Ty and Bond representing Massachusetts Massachusetts Electric Company. <clears throat> Good. You want to give us a a summary? Love to. Um, so <clears throat> essentially, what's being proposed for this project involves, as you said, the installation of a new ground mounted tra ground mounted transformer, a mounting pad, uh, approximately 135 linear feet of underground conduit and a new private property utility pole. Um, the installation of these, um, of this electrical infrastructure will involve, well, it'll all occur within the paved drive um, at 238 Nonatuck Street or per store compounds. And um, those installations will be situated generally within the Southeastern corner of the lot. <clears throat> the pad, will be installed within close vicinity of the building at the project site. And the underground conduit will be run from, will be run east from the building and from the pad through a tent, through approximately one to two foot wide trench uh, for, as I said, 135 feet before it's, tied, before it's tied into the newly installed private utility pole. The utility pole will be installed using a truck mounted auger It'll be installed to a depth of approximately six feet below surface grade. And the soil removed with the auger will be stabilized and staged in the paved upland area area prior to on-site reuse or off-site disposal. Um, all trenches will be closed at the end of each workday. And once work is complete, the trenched area will be backfilled, overlaid, and patched. As you mentioned, proposed work will result in temporary impacts within the 100 foot buffer zone to the bank of the Mill River. Um, and again, as I said, the areas where work is proposed consist of an existing paved driveway integrated. Just out of curiosity, uh, 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 when the auger uh, uh, drills a hole for a utility pole, what's the cubic 
footage of uh, soil that's removed from that? Oh, that's a good one. Um, so I'm sure it's de minimis in some some metric, but it just occurs to me that I'm I'm thinking of oh, is this like a sauna tube or is this something more substantial? When no, yeah, so the, the hole won't be any larger than uh, like I think it would be. The pole is 18 inches, so. <clears throat> Yeah, the new utility pole will be minor. The diameter of the hole is no more than 18 inches in diameter and it'll go down six feet. So, okay. yeah, I mean, we could extrapolate backwards from that, but my mental math is not, not up to <laughs> snuff. <laughs> Pi R squared. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's not necessarily a large volume of soil. Yeah. No, um, just that was a more curiosity question. Like, yeah, because yeah. it's coming out of a disturbed area anyway. Right, understood. As far as um, protective measures, all work will be conducted in accordance with Massachusetts Electric's um, best management practices. Uh, generally, what that involves is um, the installation of erosion and sediment control measures, and at the very minimum, that would be. Um, that would involve uh, either wattles or silt fencing around the perimeter of the site to just define the limit of disturbance exactly. So that would be around that paved area. Um, and then also um, your standard uh, soil stockpile stabilization measures. And how long uh, start to finish? My guess would be this shouldn't take any longer than seven days start to finish. And, but that, uh, that generally is up to who they contract to yeah. do the work. And um, I, uh, I don't know if I saw topo lines. Is this a relatively flat area? Is there uh, erosion risk uh, during construction? Uh, it's so all the work is in a very flat is in a very flat area. It's on a you know a, a flat zone um, above the bank, like upland area above the bank of the Mill River, um, and then you if it takes about a hundred feet, just in just under a hundred feet from the area of proposed disturbance until the um, you get to the bank, and I would say about fifty feet from there is when it drops down to a bench, and then down one more towards the bank of the river there. Okay. Questions from commissioners? Just a quick one about uh, what does it mean to stabilize the, the soil that's been disturbed? Sure. How does that go happen? <clears throat> So generally, that well, stabilization would involve um, perimeter control around the stockpile. stockpile. It, it also would generally involve um, like the shape of the stock, stockpile as well. So not something with like high slopes. Generally, like mm -hmm. gentle, gentle slopes, so that when water is hitting it, it doesn't have the opportunity to pick up a lot of energy moving down that and then cause erosion. Um, and uh, if and it's not uncommon either for them to use some sort of tarping or polyurethane or something to cover the pile with. Mm -hmm. Other questions from commissioners? Any questions or comments, Sarah? Sorry. Um, no, it's this one seemed pretty straightforward. It's all taking place yeah. within already disturbed area. Uh, I, yeah. I did have a question as to whether it, it would entirely qualify for the exemption cited, but I, I don't think it makes any difference either way. Uh, this, this shouldn't have any impact to the resource area. Right. Okay. Um, so this is a, um, a request for determination. So um, uh, Someone want to make a motion? Uh, uh, negative determination will not dredge, fill, or alter. Uh, check box two. Um, it's a uh, within the uh, jurisdictional zone, but will not dredge, fill, or alter. Someone want to make a motion to that effect? Go ahead, Jen. <laughs> so moved. So moved. And a second. Second. Aha. Uh -huh. um, any further discussion? If not, all in favor? 
Sir? All right, so roll call and, and David gets to join us again. David? Hi, yeah, yes. welcome, David. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Jen? Yes. Paul? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Unanimous, thank you. Good enough, thanks for your patience. Lovely, thank you for your time tonight. Um, now we have a notice of intent for construction of a stormwater outfall. Uh, this by uh, Smith Folk on uh, Lucas Street. Uh, so here, here, who, who's who's going to speak to that? Johanna. Um, presenting the DPW project. Um, I'm Johanna Stacy, I'm the senior environmental planner at the DPW. Um, and Sarah, I have a presentation to share. If that yeah, you works. should be able to share. Okay. Okay, can folks see that? Yep, it's there. Okay, very good. Um, <clears throat> so this project is proposing um, some drainage work on the Smith Vocational and Agricultural School property. Um, DPW, it, it's related to DPW's drain system, which is why where the, the um, project proponent here. Um, so just starting off, the Smith, um, Smith Folk property is located on the south side of Locust Street. Um, and the property contains school buildings um, to the east and agricultural fields to the west. Elm Street Brook is a um, perennial stream that flows south through the property. Um, and the proposed project area is adjacent to the northwest corner of the sort of developed part of the site um, and located just outside of the roadway right away. So the project area is sort of this area that we're looking at here in the picture on the right. So the project is proposing to um, do the following. The, all of the stormwater that's collected on the Smith Vocational site drains to a single manhole located near the corner of the parking lots. <clears throat> There's a 24 inch pipe from this manhole that connects to a manhole um, in Locust Street that carries the 18 inch uh, drain line that carries flow down towards an outfall that empties into Elm Street Brook. The, this system is not really large enough to have the capacity to handle large storms. Um, and as a result, it's surcharging occasionally to Locust Street, and it's also beginning to undermine the roadway. Um, so this project is proposing to replace the 24 inch connection with a six inch pipe and divert the balance of flows to a new 30 inch outfall at the northeast corner of the fields. The outfall would discharge to a stilling basin to dissipate the flow before the water discharges to the field. The basin and a portion of the new 30 inch pipe are proposed to be constructed in um, boring vegetated wetland associated with Elm Street Brook. So just looking at the existing conditions of the site, um, there's, <clears throat> there's a fair amount of built area in the Eastern portion of the site. Uh, the soils in this area are Hinkley loamy sand, so they're um, A soils. Soils in the in the fields um, are particularly in the area that gets the most drainage or silico silt loams, um, D soils. <clears throat> um, and in general, the whole site drains toward 
Elm Street Brook. Mm -hmm. um, the catchment area um, is about 14 acres in size, contains about eight acres of impervious area, um, including the buildings and parking lots, and about six, a little over six acres of pervious area, including the turf and athletic fields. <clears throat> Um, let's see, so we covered the, we covered the drain system. Um, so as you can see that there's a manhole here on the Smith prop, on the Smith Oak property. Um, and as you can see in the, the photo on the bottom of the screen, it's really all concentrated towards one manhole. Mm -hmm. that connects to the city system <clears throat> and runs down the roadway towards Elm Street Brook. So if we zoom in a little bit more to the drainage system, um, see the the 18 inch trunk line carries flow from both the Smith Folk property as well as a seven plus acre catchment on the north side of Locust Street. 18 inch trunk line has a capacity of 20.4 cubic feet per second. Um, peak runoff from a two year storm from the Smith Oak property is about 14.8 cubic feet per second. Peak runoff from the catchment area on the north side of the roadway is about, let's see, 7.7 .7 cubic feet per second. Um, so when you add these two together, they they're more than what the system can handle. And what ends up happening is water surcharges through the manhole in Locust Street to the roadway, flows down the roadway, and eventually ends up in Elm Street Brook. <clears throat> um, in addition, the other, the other thing that's happening is because it's pretty much at capacity um, or beyond capacity during a two-year storm, the, the velocity of flows coming from the outfall into Elm Street Brook are um, pretty high velocity flow. You have a 24 running into an 18. That sounds too good. That's correct. <clears throat> um, so, what we're proposing to do to reduce the flows into the city's trunk line system is to replace this 24 inch connection with a six inch pipe and divert the balance of flows, the higher flow events through a 30 inch pipe um, that empties into a stilling basin um, where the flows are really dissipated to lower the velocity. Um, <clears throat> flows then leave the stilling basin um, and go through a grass channel and they continue down slope this way towards the wetland. So the discharge from the stilling basin is still about 30, 40 feet away from the wetland. Joanny, can you describe what a stilling basin actually is? I, I've had catchment basins, uh, detention basin. Uh, I haven't seen that I know of a stilling basin. Sure, okay. Um, so it is, unfortunately, I don't have a cross section of it, but. Um, it's, it's a large basin. This, this has been designed to be three feet deep. Um, and it's lined with three and a half feet of riprap. Mm -hmm. So it really is there to handle the flows um, and really kind of slow them down um, and let them settle a little bit before it spills out over the basin. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, we anticipate that most flow from the site will be leaving the site through the six inch pipe um, about 10 times a year. We expect the overflow to actually be leaving through this 30 inch pipe. Um, <clears throat> and looking at the, the resource area impacts, we're really only working in the BBW buffer area. Um, we're proposing 1,032 square feet of permanent impact for the construction of the basin. 
and 596 square feet of temporary impacts. Um, that area will be revegetated post-construction. Um, just to get a better sense of how, how this, what this will actually look like, um, DPW engineering staff conducted a HEC or developed a HECRES model um, based on flow from a 10 year storm, 10 year 24 hour storm. So that's 4.93 inches of rain in a 24 hour period. Um, and what it's showing is that flow would leave, leave the basin kind of travel west um, in what's already a bit of a depression across the field and then head south um, and eventually start flowing into Elm Street Brook at a couple different points um, along the western portion of the field. Um, and so the photo in the bottom right is looking southwest sort of in the direction of flow, kind of a low flat area. To come up with this, this plan, um, so our main objective was to improve conditions in the Locust Street drainage system so that it could carry a 10-year storm. Um, and we developed two different alternatives. One was a complete disconnection of the um, pipe going from the Smith Folk property to the city system and diverting all of the flows to a thir new 30 inch outfall, which means that all storm events would be discharged to the field. Um, there is still some available capacity within the city's system. So it's not necessarily, don't necessarily need to completely disconnect the, the pipe. Um, so alternative two, proposes to replace the 24 inch pipe from the school property with a six inch pipe and then divert whatever flows can't be handled by the six inch pipe to the 30 inch outfall. Um, and so it's expected that storm events over one inch in 24 hour period would discharge to the field. Okay. Uh, we completed a H and H analysis um, using HydroCAD looking at three different storm events, a two year, 10 year, and 100 year storm. Um, peak runoff rates are shown in the table below. Mm -hmm. um, and we also looked at, let's see. We also looked at the proposed discharge rates at two different design points. Um, <clears throat> design point one is the, the manhole on the Smith vocational property to measure the flow reaching that manhole. The second design point is the manhole in Locust Street. <clears throat> um, so when you look to see what's happening at the manhole in Locust Street during a two-year storm, there's about 20.4 cubic feet per second that that system can handle. And then it's surcharging 0.7 cubic feet per second to the roadway just during a two-year storm. And of course, it, it <clears throat> the amount that's discharged to the roadway um, increases with, with larger storms. Um, so the table below um, shows the discharge rates for both alternatives um, at, at the same two design points. Um, and then also including the discharge from the, from the proposed outfall. Um, so looking at this, the... Uh, the flow capacity in the Locust Street trunk line is 20.4. And under alternative two, we would be looking at 19.9 cubic feet per second. So um, it has capacity to, <clears throat> to carry the flow from a six inch um, line in addition to the flow that's already flowing through the 18 inch pipe. 
with about 35, 35 CFS um, would be coming out the outfall pipe during a 10-year storm. So alternative two is the, is the proposed alternative, mm -hmm. um, which is replacing the 30-inch pipe with a six-inch pipe um, and diverting the balance of flows to the new outfall. Um, <clears throat> this alternative um, was chosen because it reduces impacts to the wetland resource areas. It should alleviate the velocity of flows coming out the outfall to Elm Street Brook. Um, it also reduces the impacts to the current use of the agricultural fields. Um, so we don't have flow coming out the outfall every time it rains, just larger storms. <clears throat> um, it reduces the uncontrolled overland flow from uh, manhole surcharge events so that we're treating more of the water um, <clears throat> and or it's allowed to flow across the field and infiltrate to some extent. Um, we estimate through the modeling that the city drain system will take about 85% of the annual flow from the Smith Oak site. Um, and the outfall would handle about 15% of the annual flow. I'm looking at stormwater standards. Um, the project addresses the stormwater standards in the following ways. Um, discharge from the outfall. Um, <clears throat> by the time it leaves the basin, um, it's estimated to be flowing about four cubic feet per second. It'll be flowing from there. The slopes are, are pretty gentle, less than 5%. Um, they're already um, vegetated, pretty solidly vegetated. Um, so we don't expect there to be any erosion. Um, we aren't changing the peak discharge from the site, or at least we're not increasing it. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, promoting infiltration by sending more of the flow across the field rather than directly through the pipe, um, there should be more infiltration to the soils in the agricultural fields. Um, <clears throat> We're not proposing to increase the TSS load from the site. Um, so additional treatment is minimal. Um, there are no new levels proposed. Project isn't in a, in a critical uh, area. Explain levels. Oh, uh, land uses of higher potential pollutant loads. So there are oh. certain stormwater <laughs> standards that apply to uh, higher okay. pollutants. Um, in terms of erosion and sediment controls, straw wattles are proposed to be used between the construction area for the stilling basin and the wetland area. Um, any of the disturbed areas will be revegetated during post-construction. Um, and for standard nine, in terms of maintenance going forward, um, DPW is proposing to periodically inspect the system. We don't expect it to require much maintenance. It should it should function pretty straightforward. Will the riprap uh, fill with with sand? The riprap it's inside the uh, stilling basin or sediment of any kind. Um, I mean, it's three and a half feet deep, so there there are some voids. Yeah, there might be some, but it's not expected that it will, will fill up quickly. Um, and is it, uh, um, again, not knowing what uh, a stilling basin looks like, is it open uh, to on top or uh, is it entirely it is. covered? Or? Yeah, no, it's, um, it's basically just a large riprap basin. And it's... Uh, but is it, is, it, uh, is it concrete or is it riprap on, on, uh, on the ground? I'm not, I'm still having yeah. trouble visioning it. Okay. So the, there'll be a sort of basin excavated. Um, after it, it'll be, it'll be pervious pretty much. 
there's geotextile fabric, and then there's three to five inches, I think, of two inch stone over the geotextile. And then there's three and a half feet of riprap layered on top of that. And then it, it's the top is open um, so that it can fill with water. Mm -hmm. A cereal bowl full of riprap around the edges. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Water pouring into it. It hits the sides and breaks the uh, energy of the flow. Then it just kind of builds up and falls over the uh, top of the bowl in all directions. Well, mostly. Oh, in all directions or in a targeted direction toward the river or yeah. the stream? Yeah, that's toward slightly stream. lower. And uh, yeah, but it's it really uh, drops the energy that's that's coming into it. Uh, maintenance. Is there a lot of is there a lot of percolation of the um, water flow into the spilling basin through the riprap and the uh, textile uh, fabric? There, yeah. 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 It can. I think the limiting factor would be the soils underneath. Yeah. Um, Joanna, yeah. what's the maintenance on that? Is it does it fill with sediment after a while and have to be cleaned out somehow? Or? Um, it's not really expect. You know, there might be some sediment accumulation over over years and years, um, but it's really receiving flow from parking lots that have catch basins. The um, deep sump? Uh, or with sumps, I'm not sure that they are deep sumps or how many of them are deep sumps. I mean, you know, if the sand runs into a catch basin and then gets into the filling basin, I don't know how long right. it's going to right. last before. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if Smith Folk uses sand in the winter on its parking areas, but uh, right. it'll end up there. It, I think it just warrants uh, periodic inspection and, and then possible removal. Was that your concern, Sarah? I, I know in your staff report you mentioned um, uh, wondering if there's any alternative to riprap. At least I think that was your comment. I, typically, we just ask in situations where riprap is proposed if flows are such that riprap is really necessary or if there's any potential vegetated option. Um, the answer is usually that riprap is necessary, um, but I, I just feel like we should always bring it up just to see always ask. A, a less okay. hardscaped option. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think I think given the flows that are anticipated, riprap would be necessary. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we we expect flows leaving the pipe during a two-year storm to be about sixteen cfs. Mm -hmm. um, so so to be able to really slow it and capture and slow down that right. energy, I think we probably need it. We, Need a hard surface. Okay. Anything else? Right. Uh, just a quick question. First of all, thanks, Jan. It's a really nice presentation. Um, is there? There's no reason, I presume, to think that the new outfall area would have any unusual contamination. In it. There's no uh, odd history. Uh, property right. cows yeah just cows <laughs> yeah yeah not that i'm aware of okay that's right i think it's been i think it's been agricultural for a while yeah okay good thanks any other questions or comments from commissioners If not, uh, 
and also uh, uh, since on Zoom, I can't be sure. Is there anybody from the public with a comment or a question? Yes, uh, Richard Aquadro here representing Smith Vocational. Okay, um, we've met with uh, Donna, the DPW director, because we had to sign off on a notice of intent. Um, our obvious concerns are erosion to our fields and uh, creating more of a wetland due to this issue um, on our property. Um, we know something needs to be done and we're trying to be a good neighbor and work with the city. And um, I had that similar question about the Stilling Basin. Thank you, Mr. Lake, for asking that question because uh, um, I built it in as a contractor um, number of retention and detention basins, but they tend to be much larger. Um, this, like one other gentleman described, a cereal bowl with you know stone in it. Um, I think that's a great explanation. Uh, so our concern is is the outfall from it uh, eroding our property even more and. Um, so they've um, included periodic inspection inspections. And then our other concern is as it goes into the Elm Street Brook that runs through our property, if it creates more erosion along the banks there. Um, and that would be addressed by the city slash DPW in some way if it starts impacting the Smith vocational property. Okay. Otherwise, uh, we're we're well aware. Of, is of there what a sense of uh, I don't know the sl Go, Go ahead. ahead. I said otherwise, we're well aware of the project and and uh, have essentially signed off on it. But we want to make sure uh, it is inspected and monitored. Mm -hmm. And your questions about uh, you know sand filling in the voids um, and do, being storm water. And yes, you'll get some, some sand from the parking lots running into the catch basins. And eventually, you know, over time, maybe clogging up that basin some and maybe not percolating into the ground. Um, my question would be, what about growth of vegetation over time? Like you'll see in a, a retention slash detention basin, such as the one down on Federal Street at Northampton High School, which uh, we built, we did that project, and that's uh, an, quite the nice, uh, uh, what should I say, <laughs> cattail uh, growth and mm -hmm. other uh, wetland growth. Mm -hmm. um, I would think um, it wouldn't be a detriment to this space, and it would help mitigate the 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 flow of water in a sense and slow it down and, and essentially, you know, weed out some of or, or filter out some of the sand um, that comes into it. So I would think, yes, maybe 10 years down the road, there needs to be some maintenance cleanup of the basin. What's your thought there, Johanna? Johanna, or how do you pronounce your name? Johanna, Johanna, thank you. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> Since it's right across the street from the DPW, it should be fairly easy to monitor, um, you know, and I think the intention is to check on it periodically if we do see vegetation growing in the riprap to, to remove it. Um, if we do notice that... Well, why, why would you remove it? Why wouldn't you just let it go its natural course and then maybe you know, turn into uh, a vegetated still basin? Or is that, that work against the intent of what this basin is supposed to be doing? Yeah, I think we, I think we want, if there's vegetation, it, it might be counterintuitive from a stormwater perspective, but if there's vegetation there, it's probably going to facilitate the uh, deposition of more sand. Um, you know, I think we want the, 
appetite Mm -hmm. uh, the riprap to be there to to really take dissipate the, the energy take that yeah well the vegetation would also dissipate the energy so this is just something that i i would say we need to keep an eye on and be aware of and uh i guess cross that bridge as it develops thank you other questions comments If uh, I guess my one last question, uh, Joanna, would be, uh, I don't know uh, the, the s slope of the river just below where the uh, Stilling Basin would uh, empty into it. Um, is there a likelihood of pooling? Will it, uh, will it uh, what's a, is there a sense of what the capacity is of the, uh, uh, river at that point. Um, yeah, so so where the Stilling Basin um, sort of discharges, the flow path from that point to a, till it gets to the river is four to five hundred feet through. Oh, the it field. is okay. I see. Right. So it's got kind so of. So it's going to be pretty to dispersed go. by the time it gets there. Yeah. yeah. That's a sheet That's, flow rather than okay. <clears throat> That's that's the idea. Yeah. Okay. Other questions, comments? Uh, if not, then uh, can a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And a second. Second. And uh, made and seconded. If no discussion, all in favor? Sarah. Wait, roll call vote. David? Yes. Jen? Yes. Paul? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Unanimous. And so we are, uh, uh, we've closed the hearing. Uh, so want to want to make a motion to uh, grant an order of conditions. Um, uh, I think probably standard conditions um, with uh, the additional, I don't know if it was in the application about uh, uh, regular monitoring because you're across the street from D, uh, DPW, but the um, that should be made more explicit, I think, as one of the conditions that uh, there be regular monitoring and uh, reports. Any other special conditions? If not, someone want to make a motion to grant an order of conditions? So moved. Mason, and a second? Second. Jen, any further discussion? If not, all in favor, Sarah? David? Yes. Jen? Yes. Paul? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Very good, thank you. Thanks, Joanna. Um, now we have a uh, uh, certificate of compliance up at Village Hill. I saw the drawing, Sarah, but I was trying to picture exactly. Um... Yeah, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me pull it up on a map. Hold on. I know there's so many different pieces of the state hospital, and they were all part of different permitting. I mean, I know it has mayor's names for the streets, but. Uh... Right, this is good. All right, so we are dealing with this subdivision here. Uh, uh -huh. So the, the very uh, when you the get the back, road, Higgins yeah. Way is this one that that comes up like this. Yep, got it. And now we can see where it is. I don't even know where the subdivision is. <laughs> well, this is the old state hospital. It is oh. actually just for fun. I will. So uh, the, just if you look down to the right, that's uh, uh, Paradise Pond. 
right? So yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yep. And I can actually, uh, our GIS coordinator just finished developing a this amazing tool where you can swipe and see exactly what part of the hospital this is. So I can show you that separately. Um, but this is sort of a semi staff assisted application. Um, I don't know if anybody knows the story, but uh, PCOI development walked away from this project completely. Uh, so the city was put in the situation of having to complete the subdivision infrastructure um, using the, the basically the bonds that the developer had posted upon granting of the permit um, several years ago. So it the system it is essentially constructed as it was designed to be. The you know it, it's infiltrating. It does retain water. Uh, there were a lot of implements that in, that had to be addressed. You know there were some uh, things that weren't constructed as designed. Some issues with the roadway that had to be dealt with. Um, but the system is working. It you know it, it's a little bit different than it was proposed. But there's no huge issues identified with it. You know, everything on the ground is exactly as it was intended to be, but the, the substructure, which wasn't dug up, could be um, a little bit different than it was initially proposed to be. But this isn't within Riverfront. Every Everything was pulled mm -hmm. out, so the, it was only subject to the stormwater standards. And we granted a, an order of conditions at some point? You did, yeah. Um, and the, the special condition here was a operations and maintenance agreement with the Department of Public Works. Yeah. Seems like I probably should remember this, but I don't. Um, it was pulled out of all our jurisdiction. Why did we even give a permit? Uh, stormwater standards. So there was a, a new outfall. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. All right, but the outfall is, oh, okay, actually now that I have, I have hiked along the river and come back up that way and I know where that outfall is. Okay, is that, that was uh, where it was designed to be? Correct. Okay, yeah. got it. So um, someone, any further discussion? Someone uh, wanna make a, a motion to grant an order of, uh, or a uh, certificate of compliance? So moved. A second. And a second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Dave? Yes. John? Yes. Paul? Yes. Mason? <coughs> yes. And Kevin? Yes. Okay. All right. Anything, Sarah? Uh, Things you've done that the commission needs to either approve or know about? Oh, let's see what's new. Um, Community Preservation Committee met uh, last evening and recommended several projects, which the Conservation Commission was a co-applicant for with the Office of Planning and Sustainability. Jen, I don't know if you want to give a synopsis of those or, or I'm happy to. Yeah, you can if you want to. <laughs> My brain uh, so, is right. <laughs> impressed with how sharp you are after two very late meeting or not this is not as late but all right i get a little zombieish after some of them but um <laughs> not too bad this week so uh conservation fund was renewed which is fantastic because that allows the the commission and staff to take quick action on potential open space projects you know if we need a survey soft if, money kind of stuff yeah, yeah if we need to get things going to, um, uh, to work on an acquisition and in we really see a, a dent in what we're able to do and how quickly we're able to move when, when that's been exhausted. So that's good to see. Um, Pomeroy acquisition, the, the match for the state local acquisitions for natural diversity grant was also awarded. So that's fantastic. Hoping to close on that pretty early in the new year. Uh, so additional 20, 229 acres hmm. um, across from the, the winery and extending uh, you know all the way to Florence, which is great. Hmm. Um, what else was there? Jen, what am I missing? There were, see. Oh, the, the trail. The, yeah. They're not right directly right. related, but a few trail projects. Um, the, the Rocky Hill Greenway segment of trail that goes, uh, we, this was discussed years ago and the commission permitted it, um, but it's been dormant for a little while. So just sort of Northeast of Pine Grove, uh, the mm -hmm. golf course property we had planned for a 
multi-use trail connection. So going from Route 66 across sort of a little bit west of the House of Corrections past the facility where they put the smell in the natural gas and connecting um, down well, by that's the what that light is. shaft bridge here. Yeah. So that eliminates this, this big area here and really connects uh, Ice Pond and neighborhoods west to the trail network, which is exciting. Uh, and also trail development funds for a, a path along the Connecticut River from Damon Road north, hopefully to Hatfield, if the town of Hatfield <laughs> wants to move forward with that. Um, wow. and, and if not all the way to Hatfield, then it will still be a, a fantastic trail with amazing views of the Connecticut River. Um, I was driving home today and looking east mm -hmm. from 91, and you could see the moon rising, and I was thinking, wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. The trail there, that, uh, that would be fantastic. So it will connect um, from Damon Road, north along the river, uh, adjacent to the railroad tracks in 91. Oops. Um, and connecting hopefully to a parking lot in Hatfield, but if the if Hatfield's not ready, then that's okay. Do we also get funding for restoration of the golf course? We did. So we got a two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollar ARPA related Department of Ecological Restoration grant to help us continue work there. Uh, so we'll we're going to start working on potential dam removal and stream restoration south of the dam, or actually downstream of the dam, not, not south, which is exciting. Has any everybody been to Pine Grove and checked it out? I mm -hmm. definitely encourage you to go out there and see nature reclaiming the golf it's course. It's really amazing how rapidly it doesn't look yeah. like a golf course anymore. I just about well made it around that walk. <laughs> And we are working on developing some accessible soft surface trails there. It, it's a little bit complicated because it does have to um, be in coordination with the restoration that we're planning. You know, we don't want to invest a lot of uh, time and effort into a trail that will eventually be underwater because the hydrology there is changing so quickly. Right. Uh, but we will be able to engage some consultants and work with the public to figure out a, a network that makes sense that people are really excited about. So all, all good news, lots of good stuff happening. Good. Great. Right. And uh, Jen, thank you for serving on the that extra commission. Um, <laughs> yeah, I if I well, have been to see Jen. <laughs> yeah, I um, I oh, I took that appointment when I was working in a greenhouse all day and not talking to anybody, and I am now working <laughs> in an office and in Zoom meetings all day, and I'm struggling a little bit with the time commitment. Uh -huh. of, sort of working full time in a thinking way. Um, so yes, plant the seed if anyone it's it's been so wonderful and it's hard like after last night's meeting it's such an amazing group and so cool to see these projects and get to think through them with such smart people. Um, so I feel sad about it, but I would love to kind of pass that hat to somebody else if anybody. Uh. Uh, usually the new guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I took it. <laughs> the, the, the newest guy. <laughs> All right, we'll talk. Well, let's let's um, let's take that under advisement and say, okay, we got we're ending a calendar year, and um, sometime in first quarter, uh, Jen would like to have somebody else other than. Her, yeah, um, stepping into that role. And when I so, when I first mentioned it to Sarah, I said I was felt very committed to seeing this round through, and I'm not going to abandon it. So um, yeah. Yeah. one of us will do it. But it, if somebody else had a little bit more availability and was willing, it really is so fascinating and wonderful, and such a wonderful group of people. So yeah. I've enjoyed it and would love to have the capacity and hope to again in the future. But just right now, it's feeling like a real stretch. So uh, it, it also is a group that only meets during the yeah. funding rounds. Uh, yeah. So they don't have a regularly scheduled every other week meeting like the Conservation Commission does. Uh, so they go through the fall round, which begins 
it's up to October now and goes through about now, depending on how many applications there are, sometimes early January, and then picks up again in February and goes through May as their summer off, unless it's absolutely necessary to meet for an expedited application or something else that's going on. But it, it's like 10 meetings a year, a lot of reading, but I, it, it's a fascinating committee to, to staff. And it, one of the few times that you get to actually allocate some funding, which is Wow. Which is interesting. <laughs> it's really fun yeah it's and it's the meetings are not there every two or three weeks sort of even during those funding rounds it's not every other week mm -hmm. always so yeah. um so yeah I've been on other grant um deliberation I love that job of kind of like how do we allocate yeah. resources so again I'm yeah. reluctant yeah. because it is so interesting and fun and it's such a good group of people, but yeah. It first, is a lot first, of sort of reading and preparation of to really do it in a good way. And yeah. First the first year we did it, we had like two point six million dollars to spend because uh, of stuff and you know we had just approved for the most amount taken out of the taxpayers to, to fund us. Right. And, uh, was it just an incredible, yeah. incredible round of yeah. grants? <laughs> no. yeah, so Mason, now just in local revenue, the committee is seeing about 1.6 million every fiscal wow. year, plus yeah. the state match. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So but there's a lot uh, of good projects and it, it mm -hmm. every round is still competitive and there there's still decisions to be made. Um, mm -hmm. How about if, uh, Sarah, could I ask that you uh, send to all of us the link to uh, that commission? And yeah, so that we just all agreed, well, well, let's look into it. And um, uh, It's on the city website and I've looked at it before, but I think if we get an email with Sarah, from Sarah with a link in it, we're more likely to actually mm -hmm. take yes. a read. So um, well, what was really interesting is I, I was on the uh, committee to come up with that commission. Um, and we had, gosh, and hearings on it and stuff, and it was it was really interesting how we were going to develop rules and regulations. Yeah, fascinating. Hmm. Well, good. Oh. Uh, so, community preservation. We'll uh, learn more about and give it some thought, and we'll talk about it um, again at our next one or two meetings. But it sounds like the uh, ideally, it would be by sometime in February that we have somebody else besides Jen um, as a representative of, of Conscom. Um, so as the next round starts up, uh, Jen doesn't go to the first couple and then drop over to somebody else. So that'll be our rough time frame to try and get a, a, a decision for. But in the meantime, we'll, we'll all learn more about it. All right. Anything hey, Mayor, else? Mayor, you're Luffles be uh, minor and your buffles non-existent. <laughs> I still haven't figured out what a kerfuffle is. <laughs> Only Trump it's, knows for Mason, sure. It's, it's like a big swivet. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Anything else, Sarah? I think that's it for me. Any anything Good. else from anybody else? I have, uh, since since our last meeting, um, I've gotten and recovered from COVID. Um, so, mm. and, oh, um, wow. Um, and it, it, you know, it's like a really bad cold, but it wasn't that bad. It was oh. just longer lasting. You know, I usually think a cold four or five, maybe six days. Yeah, this was just about the, the whole of the last couple of weeks. But in the last couple of days, I'm feeling better. And my voice oh. is back. So oh, glad you're but, feeling better. It, yes. It's survivable, um, and uh, uh, I think you know it's, it's a very different thing than it would have been pre-vaccines. Um, that yeah. it wasn't scary at all. Yeah. But. yeah. All right. Good. Well, okay. we'll see everybody in a couple of weeks. Sarah, do we have anything else going for the twenty second? If uh, if if it decides that the cutlery does not need to meet them, I no, I don't think so. Okay. 
Uh, well, maybe we'll meet on the 22nd, but at least we're planning to. And Sarah, in the meantime, I'll I'll send you a quick email um, uh, of the items I was asking about that I wanted to see addressed in um, the order of conditions that we finally grant. Okay. Great. Anybody right. else can do the same. Good. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Good night. Good night. Go sing, Paul. <laughs> <laughs>